today. I seem to be a little bit of an echo here. I'm going to push the microphone away from me. Um, I am absolutely delighted to uh, have uh, three experts with us today on the issue of internally displaced uh, persons um, for this uh, event on criminal violence and internal displacement in Mexico. Um, I'm particularly delighted because this is an issue which I have been interested in for at least four years. And I remember uh, I was actually on sabbatical up here in Washington, um, and uh, I started reading stories about uh, internal displacement and the link to criminal violence in Mexico. Um, and uh, I got on the phone, and I called my dear friend Laura Rubio at ITAM, and I said, uh, think, have you thought about this issue? And she said, I'm looking at that exact thing right now. So as much as I would like to claim credit for getting Laura interested in it, she was already ahead of the game uh, there. Um, but it's one of the issues that I think uh, has been underreported in Mexico. It's one of the issues that uh, some uh, NGOs, uh, other civil society organizations have pointed to as being important. But we've experienced uh, or suffered from a lack of data uh, on the issue. I think that we have uh, suffered from a, a lack of uh, serious research into the, uh, into the issue in Mexico. <coughs> so um, I'm delighted that we have this event here today. It's, uh, it's very, very important that we give exposure um, to, to the issue. Um, I'm going to begin by, uh, by introducing the three members uh, of the panel today. Um, the first is uh, Sebastian Albuja, who is the head of the African Americas Department at the Norwegian Refugee Council's Internal Displacement Monitoring Center based in Geneva, Switzerland. Sebastian, you have a classic Norwegian name. Um, he has re yes, exactly. He has researched and published extensively on forced displacement in the Americas. Um, Ecuadorian uh, by birth, he holds a JD uh, from the University of San Francisco de Quito and a PhD from Northeastern University, where he was a Fulbright Scholar. Um, next we have uh, Steve, and if you pronounce it, Hege, uh, Hege thank Hege. you very much, is the country analyst for the Americas at the Norwegian Refugee Council's Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. He's worked and conducted research in over a dozen countries across the globe with several humanitarian NGOs and the United Nations, most recently as the coordinator of the UN Group of Experts on the DR Congo. Steve holds uh, graduate degrees from Columbia University, uh, Sciences Po, and uh, La Universidad de los Andes, where he was a Fulbright Scholar. Uh, and last but not least, Laura Rubio Diaz Leal, uh, who is a professor of international relations at the uh, ITAM, Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, uh, in Mexico City. She's the author of several articles on forced migration in Latin America, particularly Mexico and East Asia. She's been an external consultant for the Norwegian Refugee Council's Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. She holds a BA in international relations from the Ibero in Mexico City an MA in East Asia Area Studies from the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, and a PhD on contemporary history with a focus on forced migration from the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. Um, I'm going to kick off the event by passing the, uh, the microphone over to, uh, to Sebastian, who's going to give a brief introduction um, to, the, uh, to the Norwegian uh, Refugee Council uh, and the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, and then we'll pass over to, uh, to Laura. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, just a few words about our organization and what we do so that uh, you know who's speaking to you. So the IDMC uh, was created in 1998 by the Norwegian Refugee Council, which is a large humanitarian organization. Um, it was created with the purpose of promoting the guiding principles on internal displacement, which were adopted in 1998. And since then, uh, we've been the global monitor on situations of displacement worldwide. So in this context, with this mission that we have, uh, we started collaborating with ITAM and with Laura um, maybe three years ago, um, and so what we're going to be speaking to you today about stems from that collaboration and uh, research we've been doing the last few years. Uh, with that uh, brief introduction, I'll just pass it over to Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let me see if I can pull this up. Is it already loading here, Laura? Um, <coughs> there we go. Yeah. Is this good? Yeah. Would you like to give a look? Yeah. Okay, so um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Duncan Wood for inviting us to have this panel. Uh, for us three, this has been a very important pro project for various reasons, but it will become obvious as you listen to our talk. And uh, before we start with the actual work that we have been doing, I'd like to set the context in which uh, displacement has been taking place in Mexico. Um, and I think it is safe to assume, as the United Nations High, High Commissioner for Refugee does, that 
when there's intense violence, there is internal displacement. So as a working basis, uh, this is a good place to start. So um, as you all know, violence and criminal violence in Mexico uh, exploded in 2007. Uh, homicides rates increased substantially. Uh, criminal violence of all sorts, uh, besides homicides, forced disappearance, disappearances, um, extortion, threats, petty crimes, and all sorts of crimes just um, exploded since 2007. And one of the things that made um, violence more ac acute and particularly uh, insecurity as a generalized phenomenon was um, the intervention of federal authorities and the federal security forces in various parts of the country. And this um, shows, this particular map shows the areas, the red areas in which uh, state or federal authorities has had to intervene because of institutional weakness. And this obviously just refers to the uh, municipios where there has been institutional <coughs> weakness and lack of resources to attend security issues. So besides those red areas, we would have to uh, actually add other areas where they have been able to cope with the problem and also uh, where there has been institutional weakness but the um, uh, criminal violence and the cartels are so present that they stop uh, the local authorities from uh, intervening. So in a, in a more transparent uh, uh, scenario, we would have much more red spots than you can actually see in this map. So the idea is just to show that uh, homicide rates and violence in general <coughs> increased and so did the necessity of uh, the st uh, both federal and state authorities to intervene in areas where municipal governments were unable to cope with uh, insecurity in general. So. How is the phenomenon um, in Mexico? Because we have had problems of internal displacement before 2007, and these had various forms. One traditional one has been uh, displacement because of uh, development projects. Another one has been in, uh, religious intolerance, communal conflicts, disputes over land. And as you know, the Zapatista conflict in, uh, in 1995. So 2007 is a sea change. However, it doesn't mean that those previous forms of displacement disappear. It means that they came to add, uh, uh, or criminal violence was added to the already uh, difficult problem of internal displacement in Mexico. I think what also changed besides the form of displacement was also the magnitude of the problem. Uh, religious intolerance and communal violence was very localized in the southern states of the Pacific, particularly in Oaxaca, Chiapas, and in Guerrero. Um, and uh, the, the Zapatista conflict was also localized in Chiapas. So criminal violence came to uh, complicate matters at a national level. So for us, um, our assumption is now that rather than having a localized internal displacement problem, we have a national problem. It affects the states, uh, the violence ridden <coughs> states, and it affects the states where uh, internal displaced persons arrive to. Um, so this really is now a national phenomenon. So how, what kind of, um, how does it manifest? Because we've seen, uh, not only in Mexico, but everywhere in the world, that usually displacement takes two broad forms. One is through mass displacement, and in usually we consider as mass displacement where displacements of more than 10 families are involved or the drop by drop um, displacement that takes place in a gradual form. Families that are targeted individually, 
uh, by criminal organizations and they're charged, uh, for example, what they call uh, quotas de piso and they, uh, what we can also call uh, like illegal protection, they're forced to pay uh, money to organize crime so that they don't suffer the death of a dear one, a relative or, or uh, um, or, or violence of that sort. So usually mass displacements in Mexico, which, which have been taken place uh, more um, often since 2007, are much more visible. And sometimes we see uh, not necessarily protection measures, but assistance coming uh, from uh, state authorities or municipal authorities. But usually, the, both protection and assistance have been fragmented in, and really insufficient in the best scenarios. And the displacement that takes place gradually, which is much more invisible, we think is one that is occurring the most often in Mexico. And the, the most, it is obviously the most difficult to diagnose and to uh, trace. So. <coughs> We just wanted to give you an idea of the different forms of violence that victims of forced displacement suffer, that they end up leaving their habitual places of residence in search for safety. So one of the typical ones is uh, the one, as I mentioned earlier, uh, people that are being extorted by the organized crime, they've asked for to pay a, pr a protection quota. Um, and if they fail to pay this uh, money, they are threatened or they um, suffer some kind of violence. And then to avoid for further victimization, they decide to flee. Um, another typical form of uh, displacement is the one that stems from uh, any kind of victimization either the homicide of a relative, uh, the disappearance of a relative, or whatever crime. And they try <coughs> to search for justice, or they take justice into their, uh, into their own hands, or they want truth, they want the truth, they want to know what happened to their relatives, or who killed their relatives, or whatever. And the lack of justice, and also the lack of answers, uh, has very often comes with threats, either from criminal gangs, criminal organizations, or from state authorities that are in some kind of a uh, collaboration with organized crime. So they are forced to flee. Families from young men who have refused to become part of criminal groups, they are harassed and threatened by, by criminal organizations. Peasants who have been forced to sell their lands at a very uh, small amount of the real value to drug cartels to use them for illegal um, uh, for cultivation of illegal drugs. Families of former higher hitmen who have been uh, killed and they are victims of extortion and threats. Families of victims of bystanders and in innocent witnesses. And also, <laughs> which uh, there have been a, a, a few studies in Mexico already taking place where they trace how fear of being a victim plays a big role in people's decision to flee to other safer areas. Um, so the generalized perception of threat is a valid uh, cause for uh, displacement. We also have small and large business owners who have been victims of extortion, who flee violence and go to less violent places or even to the United States. And finally, another one who has been the um, subject of more debate has been the displacement of families of journalists, threatened um, mayors of, uh, of the most violent municipalities in Mexico, public servants, human rights activists, and journalists. So having described the phenomenon, um, and also seeing that in the past eight years, it has been very absent from public debate, 
It has been, there has been a tendency of the government, well, first from the Felipe Calderón's uh, administration, and uh, now still not recognized by the incumbent president. Um, this absence of uh, an official recognition of the phenomenon as a, world as a worldwide, as a national wide phenomenon has also um, uh, caused the absence of appropriate protection and assistance uh, for those affected by this phenomenon. So, so we've described the, the phenomenon, but we don't actually know exactly the extent of the problem. We know that it's there, and we uh, don't know exactly the extent of the, of the problem. So what we have done in the past uh, few years has been together with the IDMC, and um, demographers, sociologists, um, lawyers, etc., to look at the evidence to see what is the extent of the problem and what are the vulnerabilities that the people who suffer displacement struggle with. So we've looked at four different sources of evidence. One is statistics, uh, national statistics of various sorts, um, surveys of various sorts, testimonials, and the press, the media. So statistics, we've looked at uh, midterm population count that happens every five, uh, well, every 10 years, the five years that, uh, that the census doesn't take place. <coughs> the last uh, population census of 2010, uh, violence uh, rates and statistics and marginal marginalization rates. And this we have crossed with judicial statistics, mortality rates, um, a census that looks at local governments, at the municipal and dele delegational, that's more in Mexico City, but uh, uh, at, at that micro level. We've, have, we've, we've looked at uh, a very interesting survey that um, is gathered uh, every three months. At, it's Encuesta Nacional de Ocupación y Empleo. It's uh, for um, labor, it, it measures labor, um, mar the labor mar market in Mexico. The survey of victimization and perceptions of public security, which was a national one, the, an, a private one that looks at citizenship, democracy, and narco violence and the impact in civil society, and the Latin America Public Opinion Project, and uh, a very localized survey applied in Ciudad Juarez. So all these sources uh, tell us that there is a definite link between uh, violence and migration, which means that a lot of the states that experience violence also have very high rates of migration. Uh, municipalities with the highest rates of violence, like Tijuana, Chihuahua, Ciudad Juarez, Monterrey, and Coahuila in Sinaloa, also have uh, one of the biggest migration rates. The states of Chihuahua, Durango, Sinaloa, and Guerrero have also lost a lot of population uh, due to violence. So, in general, in the most violent municipalities, uh, which we included in a study that we've been carrying out, 70% of the violent states have lost population. Between 2000 and 2010, uh, we saw an increase of homicide rates in 42 of the uh, municipios that we looked at, particularly in the northern states and the Pacific states and Oaxaca. <coughs> also, through looking at the survey on victimization and perceptions of public security, we, s we can see that 1.3% of Mexican families lose a member of the family. I mean, lose not because they're dead, but because they decide to move because either uh, they are uh, threatened or because for them the situation uh, is not sustainable in the long run and they decide to go to safer areas. 80.2, and obviously I, I, we will talk about the obstacles and the uh, imperfections of all this, um, 
or the limitations that all these sources uh, have because we have um, concluded that all this evidence that we will be providing are good sources of evidence to say there is a problem, there is no doubt about it, but there is a need for a more systematic uh, profiling and um, diagnosis so that we could have a real uh, uh, figure. Everybody wants a figure and we've been pressured uh, <coughs> incessantly <coughs> to provide uh, a number and we have um, constantly also uh, not be tempted by it because we understand the difficulties in getting at a uh, number that is not debatable. So 80.2% of those who left Ciudad Juarez just in Ciudad Juarez had a job and also most of them had property. This also tells us uh, when we mention the the uh, link between violence and uh, displacement, that there is a uh, misperception or, or some people who try to uh, deny or downplay the significance of the problem is by saying that a lot of them have left because of um, prob economic <coughs> and social issues rather than violence. And by looking at the numbers of people fleeing from the most violent states, and, and actually studying the situation of uh, many of them, we see that most of them had jobs and, and stable jobs, and most of them had uh, their own property. So they don't fall, fall into the um, lower end of society that tells us that it is social and economic issues that force them to flee. So recognizing these all statistics statistics, um, as I mentioned, they have uh, some flaws, either because um, they don't um, measure all the municipal areas, or because they don't disaggregate the information by introducing in their surveys very refined questions that would allow us to measure uh, from where and to where they're going. Um, another difficulty that we found is that um, in the census in 2010, it is exactly the census information that could allow us, if the, pro the appropriate questions were introduced in the census, it is a census that would allow us specifically, specifically to know why <laughs> people left, from where they left, and where they are. And so far, the, uh, the census in 2010 does not have questions that would allow us to make those conclusions. So in order to have a national um, map of the problem of displacement, we would need to have a census with sp very specific questions. One thing that we've noticed with all this um, information is that most people flee from one violent municipio to a less violent municipio within the same state. So unless we have very specific questions that allow us to have the, the segregated information, it is impossible for any of these surveys to actually tell us a precise number of the people fleeing violence. So the, all the surveys and the <coughs> statistics that we have looked at in the past uh, years, they stop in 2010. <coughs> so what we wanted to show is that violence is still going on, it's still affecting now other states or it has increased in other states like Michoacan and Sinaloa in the past two, three years. So what we've done is because of lack of statistical uh, statistics and, and surveys uh, uh, um, available, we looked at media and uh, newspaper, newspaper, blogs, everything uh, that has been reported in the past two and a half years. And we've seen that at least 67 he episodes in, in some of the most violent states have been reported, particularly in the most violent states of Michoacán, Guerrero, and Sinaloa. So 67 mass displacements in the past two and a half years. And 
finally, from, from uh, my part, that it's uh, trying to show the evidence that we've looked at is testimonials. We've um, conducted more than 32 interviews but to victims of violence, but 32 testimonials provided uh, a lot of uh, information that supported a lot of um, the conclusions that we've drawn up to now. So these testimonials have uh, given us a sense of the vulnerabilities that these, th these people are uh, suffering and the forms of the victimizations. And they have come mostly from the states of Guerrero, the Estado de Mexico, Michoacán, Chihuahua, Veracruz, Nuevo León, and Sinaloa. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Who's next? Steve? Ah, Sebastian, thank you. Uh, the control is right here. Would you like to, or would you like me to move forward through the presentation? There's only two slides. Okay, um, perfect. Yeah. I, I can do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, so Laura has spoken to us about um, the patterns and the, um, the different um, evidence of internal displacement in Mexico. I'm going to speak to you briefly about the response to internal displacement. As Laura mentioned, uh, internal displacement has been predomin predominantly ignored uh, by the government in the last uh, five, um, five years. And, uh, and why, is, why is that? I mean, there's many political reasons that, that I don't go into, into analyze and, and we as a, a humanitarian organization don't uh, make a value judgment on. Um, however, the main reason why the displacement hasn't been acknowledged has to do with uh, what I would call here sort of a, 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 an issue of, of lens, an issue of how the problem is looked at. Um, I don't know if you have read um, Howard Zer's book that's called Changing Lenses, precisely that title, um, and it's a book that's been out for, I think, a couple of decades. Um, he has been a promoter of what he calls um, restorative justice, so basically justice that focuses on victims rather than offenders. And here, allow me to read to you this quote that I have up there in the PowerPoint. Traditional criminal justice seeks answers to three questions. What laws have been broken? Who did it? And what do the offenders deserve? Restorative justice asks instead, who was harmed, what are their needs, and whose obligations are those needs? As you can see, there's a fundamental different lens between traditional criminal justice and restorative justice. So basically the contention is that in Mexico, the response to the effects of crime, to internal displacement, has been driven, uh, has been taken forward as a response to crime, a traditional criminal justice response, where the emphasis is on punishing offenders on killing drug kingpins, uh, kingpins, on arresting them, on disarticulating the drug cartels. Now, these are legitimate goals that a government should pursue. Um, however, when the response focuses only on that part and not on the needs of victims at all, then you have a situation where if this, the scale of violence is so big, as in Mexico's, Mexico's cases, then you have the conditions effectively for a humanitarian crisis. In any other state where the response to crime focuses only on punishing criminals, you have a problem. But when you have violence of that scale that Laura described, then you have the conditions for a humanitarian crisis. Next slide, please. Um, so basically the contention is there needs to be a change of lenses in the response to, to crime and to, to the effects of crime in Mexico because of the scale of the phenomenon and because it continues for a period of, of many years now. And so this response need to be focused instead on what international law calls protection to people affected by displacement or people displaced. So protection is basically the angle that international refugee law takes, that guiding principles on internal displacement take, which is focusing on protecting and advancing the rights of victims, notably those who are forced to flee, because th those who are forced to flee have special vulnerabilities that needs, need to be protected. So basically, if that, that shift was to take place in Mexico, this would allow for a proper response of, of, uh, for internally displaced people. So what you have up there in that kind of confusing uh, table, basically, is you have in the columns, three columns, safety and security. On the right hand, you have economic and livelihoods. And then in the middle, it says between A and B, a mix of A and B, or neither A nor B. So what does this all mean? Basically, in, in the left, you have people that are fleeing because of safety and security that are basically forcibly displaced, whether crossing borders or remaining within their own countries. So these people are traditionally refugees or IDPs, and they are protected in their international framework by international refugee law and by the guiding principles on internal displacement. And then people on the right, uh, the right uh, hand side column are economic migrants, people that, that flee, that change, or that flee, that change place of residence looking for work. 
these people don't have the need for special protection and aren't therefore protected by the international protection framework. Now the tricky part comes in the middle, and this is the contention, that in Mexico, there's a lot of people that are in between um, and a mix of both. So basically pe people that flee, but also people that, that change their place of residence because their economic environment has declined because of violence. So it's, a, it's an interaction of all these causes. And so uh, people in, in the column in the middle aren't um, protected, for example, when they cross a border, if they seek asylum in the US, they aren't protected as refugees because they don't, they don't fall under the definition of the International Refugee Convention. They may be protected by the Cartagena Declaration, which is a non-binding declaration in the Americas that has a more extensive definition of a refugee. Uh, but it is a particularly problematic um, group of people in, in the sense of that the protection framework, response, framework is not uh, inclusive of, of their response. So um, that is briefly um, a description of the situation of the protection of, of first, how the, there needs to be a shift in how people that are fleeing criminal violence in Mexico need to be responded to and what the international protection framework tells you. And then ultimately, of course, what matters is what the state does nationally, because as international law says, states are the first responsible for providing protection for people that are fleeing within their countries. So um, ultimately, in this case, the Mexican state is the one who needs to, to take forward um, a protection response for, for people that are displaced. And so here I'm going to pass it over to Steve, who's going to tell you about what has been happening, because some things have been happening. When we say that displacement has been neglected and denied, it has been the stance of, of the administrations in general, but there has been certain efforts at different levels, different institutions. So Steve is going to describe that to you, and then what needs to happen um, to actually make that response happen in Mexico. So over to Steve. Ah, um, and just briefly to say, so in addition to what Laura has said about uh, the different patterns of displacement, we have also been able to see that people who flee have special vulnerabilities that, that require protection. So the most common ones are uh, related to, to issues of protection in the places, um, uh, uh, so issues related of their, of their housing, land, and property rights. When people le flee, um, they usually leave behind their homes or their land. So think if you had to leave uh, to flee a war violence, you leave your house behind or your property, then that's appropriated by others um, or it's just left behind. So that's a huge issue when there is displacement in general. So in the case of Mexico, it has been documented. There's issues of housing, land, and property, um, um, issues of, of livelihood opportunities um, in the places of arrival. When, I, when IDPs, internally displaced people, arrive in, in, in their places of displacement, they aren't always able to insert themselves into labor markets. So they actually drop into poverty. So displacement actually drives people into pro processes of impoverishment. Um, next one. Um, and in general, access to services into the basic necessities of life. Some of the surveys that Laura mentioned um, have shown that, that IDPs um, aren't able to access health in their, in their places of displacement, or their children aren't able to readily involve in school because they don't have documents and so on. So there's, there's a range of, of, of protection needs that people that are forced to flee have that, uh, that need to be sort of the part of a comprehensive response. Over to you, Steve. <coughs> Thank you, Sebastian. As uh, Sebastian mentioned, um, although there's not, there hasn't been a, a clear government strategy and recognition of the phenomenon of displacement, um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the, the, the different responses that have taken place, uh, covering particularly the previous government of, of Felipe Calderón and some of the openings and opportunities that exist and initiatives that are currently underway. Um, First, as we all know, uh, President Calderón um, declared a, a very aggressive militaristic strategy on, on drug cartels throughout the country. Uh, part of this, the, the part of his uh, and his, his, his administration's unwillingness to recognize uh, internal displacement was the fact that that internal displacement and these victims were symbolic of the shortcomings of that strategy in and of itself. The fact that they was, this, this strategy was producing um, uh, producing a, a, a humanitarian situation um, that was in some cases considered similar to that of a, of a, of a conflict, of an internal armed conflict. Uh, this became a very, very contentious issue to recognize that, that there was internal displacement within the country. Nevertheless, despite this, this outwardly resistant denial of the phenomenon during the Calderon administration, there were a number of initiatives that did, did have uh, uh, an impact on 
internally displaced. Uh, first, just as many have followed uh, initiatives to, to vet the, the police, uh, which had certainly their shortcomings, uh, no doubt uh, would, would have had a, an indirect impact on preventing displacement, uh, given some of the infiltration of, of, of the state and the security services. The same with the judicial system. Uh, as Laura pointed out, the, 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 um, the actual uh, victims seeking of justice uh, in many cases leads to uh, threats and, uh, uh, and eventually displacement. Uh, so these were sort of indirect initiatives to address some of the, some of the causes of displacement. Um, but there's also been some, some uh, other legislative initiatives that took place during the Calderon administration. Unfortunately, they were not successful due to some of uh, lack of political agreement and, and consensus over technical definitions of what is an internally displaced uh, person. Um, some of the other fragmented initiatives have, have come from state or federal level uh, uh, initiatives of the Calderon administration, particularly uh, just speak quite very quickly about Pro Victima, um, which was created by presidential <coughs> decree in September 2011. This was finally a recognition of, of, of President Calderon to, to say that there have been victims, and particularly victims of, of disappearances and, and kidnappings were, were the, the attention of, of Pro Victima. Um, However, the pro victima was given very limited resources and uh, essentially the idea was to consolidate uh, the different institutions and uh, state resources into one uh, sort of uh, one center which would be able to uh, receive and, and attend to victims, but not actually provide them with enemy services themselves, but simply receive them and redirect them back to those state agencies. However, what the, the, the fact that they had already taken those resources away from those state agencies to create pro victima when they send those victims back, there were, also, there were, there were less resources then uh, for those original state agencies to be able to attend to them. Uh, pro victima also didn't work with a, a clear definition of, of, of what is internally displaced. Um, internal displacement was seen as simply, and, and continues to be seen uh, by many in, in Mexico as simply a consequence of other, uh, other um, uh, incidents of crime. So if someone flees or has to flee because they've been, they've been uh, threatened or they've been the subject of, of extortion, but the actual fleeing and, and the, 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 the relocation of the individual is not seen exactly as, as, as a crime in and of itself or a, a um, a, a, a victimization. So they, they were limited in what, what, what they could do. Actually, one of the only things that Pro Victima has been able to do for, for uh, internally displaced was a program that uh, sought out housing sub subsidies for people who had families, particularly families that had to find a new location in, um, as a result of threats uh, or general insecurity. However, through, uh, through the end of um, uh, of last year, they had only helped three, 13 families to, to relocate uh, with these subsidies. So it's been very, very limited in, in, in the way that, that uh, they've been able to, to assist uh, victims. Um, two other uh, organizations or institutes, the, the Comisión Nacional del Desarrollo de los Pueblos Indígenas, the CDI, um, has had a program, a long-standing program for internally displaced uh, indigenous families uh, with only an exclusive focus on religious and uh, political conflicts. Um, so not natural disasters, not uh, organized crime, which is uh, of particular <coughs> interest to us. Um, and what that program helped to do was exclusively to find land for these families, to help them to build uh, urban housing, um, with providing them with basic construction material and some basic minimal sort of uh, seeds and, and, and tools. Um, so it's very, very limited uh, in scope. However, in just three states alone, just looking at religious and, and conflict and, and political conflict, um, the CDI has, has identified 7,600 families. Um, so this is, this is a program that has experience in attending to the needs of, of displaced uh, communities, but is, is, is certainly under-resourced. Um, a few other, a few other um, initiatives, actually, I'll just jump to, to actually at the, at the state level. Um, although there's not been a federal program uh, outside of the CDI, the certain state level uh, um, initiatives have, have been uh, undertaken, particularly in Guerrero. Um, at municipal uh, presidents have undertaken efforts to, um, 
to provide certain levels, certain minimum levels of support, uh, protect civil protection uh, at, the, at both state and municipal level, has also provided support in the cases of what Laura described as mass displacement, where those, those have mostly been improvised and, and, uh, and, and been very limited in scope. Um, however, in Sinaloa, there's an interesting example of, of support for, um, for employment for displaced communities. Uh, and and that's, that's also had some, some success in looking at a bit more than simply uh, quick one-off uh, assistance. Uh, in Chiapas, as an example of another state that's, that's tried to tackle uh, internal displacement in early 2012, a, a state-level law was passed uh, to address the 25,000, particularly with a focus on the 25,000 uh, internally displaced from the armed, uh, from the armed conflict um, of the early 90s. However, that, that law is still waiting its, its regulation, so there's been still some delays in, in its implementation. Um, in terms of international support, um, it's also been because of questions of sovereignty. Uh, Mexico is a state with uh, considerable resources, um, 13 biggest uh, economy in the world, international agencies that usually uh, provide uh, assistance or accompaniment to, to governments in providing support to internally displaced, uh, notably the, the, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees or the International Organization of, of Migration, uh, have, have not focused on internal displacement. Uh, UNHCR has focused exclusively on, on refugees. Uh, Mexico does receive refugees from Central America as well as other places across the world. And the IOM has focused on, on, on migration, particularly uh, economic migration to, to the United States. Um, so the international response has been very, very minimum, if, if not, uh, there's been a, a reluctance to, to tackle and recognize the issue because of questions of, of sovereignty and the fact that the previous government, as I said, did not want to recognize the, 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 the problem. Um, now, going on to the, the current administration, um, we have a, 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 few, a few interesting initiatives as well. Um, the first is the, the, the National Commission for, for Human Rights um, had begun to, to develop a protocol uh, defining what is an internally displaced person, what should be the, uh, the, their rights based upon international guiding principles of internal displacement. And this was a very positive initiative and it's, 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 it's underway and, and, and working towards its publication, which should have a, an important impact on, um, on the state level uh, uh, human rights commissions as well. As well, within that, within that study, there will also be more information about um, sort of the breadth of, of, uh, of phenomenon of, of internal displacement, basing particularly on the information coming out of those, those state level uh, commissions on human rights. Um, one of the focus of, of government, uh, the current government, uh, President Peña Nieto's administration has been on crime prevention, turning the page a bit on the militaristic uh, strategy and looking towards crime prevention. So within the National Crime Prevention Plan, uh, there is one of, the, one of the elements or components of that plan is to address uh, internal displacement. Uh, however, uh, they're in a current period of simply studying the, the phenomenon, trying to, uh, as we all are, trying to get a sense for the scope and some of the causes and develop a, 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 a public policy. But that, that, is, that is in place and it's been, it's been recognized within, that, within the crime prevention uh, program. So as the government hasn't made a, an open statement about internal displacement, within its cornerstone uh, uh, policy of crime prevention, there is recognition of, of this. Um, there's also earlier this year, there was a law passed in the Protection of Human Rights Defenders and Journalists. And as Laura pointed out, this is the, the, the attacks on human rights defenders and, and threats against them. It leads often to their displacement within the country. And, and this mechanism not only tries to prevent their displacement, but when they do, when they are forced to, uh, to move and you know, relocate to, to other urban centers, that they're, they're followed up with, with basic minimum me uh, uh, mechanisms of, of, of security. Um, which is, which is a, a, a big improvement over, uh, over the previous administration. Um, a, a worrying uh, development, I think, and, and, and some people have inter interpreted it as, as a, a response to a local level response to internal displacement has been the rise of, of self-defense groups, um, in particularly Michoacan and, and Guerrero. Um, some of these groups certainly have ambiguity about their, uh, about their, their objectives, but in theory, uh, and, and in, in certainly in, in, in some of the cases, they are there to protect their communities from, from organized crime. 
and therefore and, and protect their land and, and their property from, from being expropriated by organized crime. And that's, that's certainly a new development. There's a, certainly an ambiguous stance by the, by the government with regards to the self-defense groups. Um, and, and finally, just in, with, in terms of new legislation, uh, we've had a chance to, to uh, speak with and, and work with uh, some, uh, a group of senators that are making uh, important proposals on reforming. Not only has there been a, a proposal for a national level law on, on internal displacement, but there's been uh, uh, proposals to reform the, the general population law uh, to provide a, a clear definition um, for displacement, which would be, uh, um, which would be very, uh, a, a big step in the right direction in terms of providing a, a clear framework um, for, uh, for uh, internal displacement programs uh, that would require certainly interinstitutional and intersecretarial uh, coordination. Um, I just it's not on there, but just the the uh, as well the the victims law is quite important, and I just uh, conclude uh, with that the victims law, uh, th which was the the result of of of, um, of the victims movement, uh, was passed earlier um, right at the beginning of the Peña Nieto uh, administration, and it's in currently being uh, under consideration for regulation. Uh, however, there's a few things within the law that are quite important in terms of uh, internal displacement. Uh, one is that it recognizes the right to, for, for victims to return to their homes if they've had to flee, uh, which is quite important. Um, Article 38 also establishes the right to housing for those who have, uh, have had to flee, uh, temporary housing that the government should, should provide. Um, however, there's still not a very clear definition within the law about what is, what is a, an internally displaced person. And in, in speaking with some of the authors uh, of, of the law itself, there's still a misconception about uh, internal displacement as simply being a, a, a consequence uh, of, a, of other uh, uh, victimizations or, or, or other, other uh, incidents of crime. So as I said, uh, extortion leads to, extortion is the, actual, uh, is the actual crime, and you are a victim of extortion, you're not necessarily a victim of, of internal displacement. So being forced to flee from your home, you're, you're actually just simply a victim of, uh, of that threat but not necessarily the act of being forced to flee from your home. So there is some development that needs to be done in the basis of, of, of the victim's law, but it's certainly an important, um, an important framework within which the, the government can, can uh, um, continue to develop programs for internally displaced. One of the things that we've been, we've been talking about is the creation of, uh, of, of a committee uh, the victims law lays out a number of committees for specific types of victims uh, and is, it doesn't include one for, uh, for internally displaced uh, but there's, there's, an there's an opportunity to establish new committees based upon constituencies that, 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 that may arise. Um, so that would be uh, uh, an important development as well. Um, we'll just finish up with some of the challenges. Uh, as Laura pointed out, there's a, there's a clear need uh, despite all of the evidence that that we've been able to gather, there's a clear need for a more comprehensive assessment of the phenomenon. Um, we could go into more details of some of the specific limitations of some of these studies and, and, and the way that surveys uh, frame or, or word some of, their, um, some of their questions about displacement that, that lead to potential uh, misinterpretations or, or weaknesses in, in those conclusions. What is really needed is a, is a very clear national uh, assessment and that can only be done uh, we from civil society can, can, uh, can raise some of these issues to say that you can't, uh, there's, there's no way to deny that this is actually happening. There may be discussion or debate about the scope and the breadth of, of actually of the internal displacement in Mexico, but there shouldn't be any more debate about whether it's, it's happening or not. And um, there should be more uh, a push from different sectors of society for the, the population count, uh, midterm population count of 2015 to include specific questions about uh, internal displacement, as Laura said, exactly from where and to where and, and for what particular causes. Um, so this is very important and certainly profiling then uh, can be done uh, um, qualitatively about some of the needs and the, and the vulnerabilities, as Sebastian pointed out, the vulnerabilities in terms of education, housing, uh, physical security uh, of, of this population so that then uh, proper, uh, proper and comprehensive programs can be designed. 
Um, legislative definition, as I said, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a core constituency within the Senate right now that is emerging to try to push this forward uh, for this legislative definition of, of internal displacement. Uh, but that's, it's, it's very low, let's say, uh, realistically, it's quite low on, on, the, on the priorities, the legislative priorities of, of the Senate, uh, Senator. Um, or President Peña Nieto has certainly pushed forward some other reforms, particularly energy reforms, uh, um, that are, that are, that are uh, much higher priority. Um, the national program uh, for IDPs within the, uh, within the national program for uh, crime prevention is, has not been designed yet. As I said, there's a, there's a, there's a group working on this now in it looking at uh, basic assessment uh, and proposing um, uh, what would be the core sort of components of that, of that program. But that's, that's certainly in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very initial phase, but hopefully by the end of 2014 there will be uh, more developments on that program, and that would be uh, that would be carried out by the the, uh, the Interior Ministry, Secretaria de Gobernación. Um, and within that program, there would be uh, a national registry, uh, but certainly uh, for uh, individuals to to um, to register, there has to be a, a long process of reconstructing trust with the state, uh, and a lot of that has been has been lost in many parts of Mexico as a result of, of the very high levels of violence and the fact that those that have previously <coughs> gone to the state for, uh, for assistance or for protection have not found it. Um, so that's sort of a long-term long process and, and part of that is also capacity building for the state itself, uh, for state servants to, to uh, understand a bit better and be more aware of the rights of internally displaced uh, and the particular subset of victims that are those that have been forced to flee from their homes as a result of organized crime. So, Chris, up there, thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve, Sebastian, and Laura. Um, we have a good, healthy uh, period of time now for, for questions and conversation. Um, I have a couple of questions here myself that I'd like to put, but I'd like to take uh, two or three from the, uh, from the audience, if everybody is brave enough to, uh, to kick off the process while you're deliberating. Ah, oh, there we go. We have a brave soul over here. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, speaking into the microphone clearly. Um, and uh, We will respond as they come, or you will gather them. I'm going to take, two, if there are two or three out there, then I'll take those and uh, we'll put them okay. together. Okay, please. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Jose Lobo. I'm a Georgetown University study student, and I'm from Mexico. And my question is for, for Laura. Um, I know it is very hard and I understand the difficulties and complexities of measuring this, this problem. Uh, we're having the problem of how to measure the homicide rates, and there you have a body, so displacement, it's, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. But what can be a good range uh, estimate? I mean, <laughs> there was a, 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 a <laughs> data you, you said there, one point something percent from a NEGI survey, so what can we say, like it's one and point half million, or, or what could be a, a, a an approximate number just to, to have an idea of, of, the, of the, 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 the magnitude of the problem? And my second question is, um, you give some causes of, of why the people is moving, but uh, do you know who is moving, meaning uh, if, if it, there's obviously people that maybe want to move, but ha don't have the resources? So I know in, in some in EG, in EGIS, uh survey, there's a question about uh, the willingness to move if you have the resources. Do you, do you have a, a, a data on that or, or, I mean, it's obviously also difficult, but can you elaborate Thank you, Jose. That? So the okay. pressure continues for a number. <laughs> um, anybody else here? Uh, I, have, I have one question that I'd like to add at this point in time. Um, you mentioned that uh, there's, a, there's a core group in the Senate right now that is looking to, uh, to push you know, for progress in this area. Um, what about civil society groups in Mexico? Who are, the, who are the prime movers on this and who are the ones who are really driving uh, the process forward, uh, applying pressure to both the government and the Congress on it, if you don't mind? Anybody else at this point? There's one question here. Um, hi, my name is Christina Avalos and I'm an intern with um, UNHCR here in Washington, D.C. And my question is actually for Sebastián. Um, you mentioned that um, one of the challenges to addressing the needs of IDPs is this is the way that um, the Mexican government views the problem. So there needs to be a shift in the lens. And although this may be a philosophical question, I'm curious into what you think can be serve as a catalyst for this change in, in perception and in this kind of lens shift within the Mexican government. Okay, great, thank you. Let's take those three questions and then we'll come back for a second round. Uh, 
um, I won't succumb, succumb? Succumb. Succumb <laughs> to the pressure. <laughs> but I will tell you a bit of the numbers that have come out and you can decide for yourself, but we don't have a stand there because um, it's very tempting because it sells, um, but uh, we consider that it's not very professional to do so. So I'm just going to be quite uh, objective about this. So we found the first uh, number that uh, we used as our working basis was a study that was conducted by the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez which based its study um, just on the uh, Chihuahua, and particularly El Valle de Juárez. So from that survey, which was supplied in 2010, the first number of uh, 230,000 came up, and that survey said that half of those uh, fled to the U.S. and the other half stayed in. So we had a working basis of 115,000 just in the Valle de Juarez. Um, we have a very reliable um, number of 25,000 in Chiapas. This is based on a very <laughs> systematic work <laughs> of NGOs um, working in the state. And as far as the rest of the country goes, there's no reliable data. Um, one study that has just recently been quoted a lot was a study by, which I haven't seen, so it's, it hasn't been done public, but the figure has come out. It's about um, a Penuth and CSS, the, 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 the Penuth and uh, uh, anthropology, uh, Social Anthropology Center uh, in Mexico, and they talk about um, 330,000 displaced persons just in the four states of the north, uh, meaning Nuevo León, Tamaulipas, Chihuahua, and Coahuila. Um, so uh, I, we don't know the methodology they used. We don't know the kind of survey they applied. So, um, and we've seen other sources like Parametria, which w that's what the media love the most because it talked of a million and 600 uh, displaced persons. So that obviously is a big number. So, um, but we looked, uh, we couldn't look in detail into the me methodology because they didn't answer our calls and they didn't want to really speak out about the methodology they used. But looking at um, some of the um, public material that, they, that uh, there was, um, one of the questions is uh, the typical question that says, do you know someone who has been forced to flee because of violence? So the same person or a few persons could be referring to the same family. So they didn't give uh, or provide a, s a last name or a first name so that we could um, cross the information and uh, and make sure that the mistake um, uh, margin was not too high. So, so when I say that we cannot succumb to the temptation, it's it's a serious matter, I think, uh, and that's why uh, when we try to look at the statist uh, statistics um, available. Uh, one of our, d our team of demographers was the first caution that they gave us. Uh, we cannot make any assumptions without these questions that we need um, to introduce to the census, the, to the population census. So um, reliable, we can say, 25,000 in Chiapas plus 115,000 from Ciudad Juarez. If, if, um, if we look at the study that was done by CSA San Penuth and uh, 330,000, um, so it just, I, I wouldn't dare to say more than that without uh, more professional and careful uh, analysis with the proper questions in place. And so that's the first question. The, first, the question as to who leaves. Um, 
We've tried with a number of uh, chambers of uh, commerce throughout the country to measure, uh, because we know that obviously both with money and without money flee. But those with money don't ask for public support or protection or assistance. They do on their own accord and they, l they sometimes go to the U, they move their families to the US and they commute every one, uh, once in a while to look and, 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 uh, and work in Mexico. But um, we don't have also reliable data of those um, who are part of w one of these chambers uh, of commerce or whatever uh, when they move, but we know that people from Monterrey have been moving and they, their, their children who were studying in, in the Tech de Monterrey, they have moved elwards, they've moved to Querétaro. We have some evidence of, um, of a flow of students that have transferred from Monterrey to, uh, to Querétaro. We have people ha that have moved to Tlaxcala and Puebla, but there is, again, no systematic evidence that has recorded this. We have also tried to look at um, statistics from uh, La Secretaría de Educación Pública from the Education um, uh, Ministry and because it's not centralized all the information we had to uh, ask each state to provide some of the information as to the dropouts and then if they were um, reinstated in, in another part of the country and there's no information available on that site. So as you can see it's, it's very difficult. But so the rich leave and then when the poor leave is because the situation is unsustainable. It means that they've lost everything. We have a few testimonials that are really heartbreaking, and I, and I can tell you one that it's, it's very typical. Um, a family from a poor county in Michoacán, um, they, uh, they had a lucrative business on, um, what do you call uh, recuperation? Just metal recuperation? They go uh, door, d they just go door by door and asking for uh, bracelets and earrings that they don't use. And then when they have enough, they go to a uh, founding Stop. place and then they sell it to jewelry. Yeah, mm -hmm. just gold, you know? And um, <laughs> they became, um, for a small town, they became quite affluent and then the organized crime they were covering the whole uh, territory I of Mexico and they started being um, extorted by the organized crime and they were charged uh, a, an amount of uh, 5,000 pesos a week just to be able to work in Guerrero. So when they failed to pay the organized crime two of the sons of the family disappeared uh, two years later, as they carried on, uh, carried on with their work, two other sons of a family of eight disappeared in the state of Veracruz. So out of a family of eight children, four disappeared working. So as they were asking for justice and trying to know the truth of what happened to them, the, families began b the family began to uh, being threatened uh, by local authorities as their inquiries began and of course they lost all the money they had and all the money that they had gathered throughout uh, a decade, they lost it in um, legal fees and commuting to Mexico City trying to get someone to listen to them, etc. So at the end they were displaced because of the threats. So regionally they suffered extortion, um, they were victimized with the disappearances and then they become, they became uh, uh, threatened, and then they had to flee because to save their lives. So now they are in the state of uh, uh, Mexico. So, so they had nothing. By the time they decided to flee, they had nothing. So, usually, this 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 family, they 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 became quite. Um, uh, high-profile case uh, because they became quite activists. Um, but you have many of, of families that are not activists and they don't get um, any help because they don't ask for justice or they just stay quiet because they don't want to be uh, victimized anymore. Um, so everyone in, in circumstances of vulnerability flees. 
Um, so there is a matter of choice, but I think for people with less resources, when they leave is because they actually don't have anything else. And, um, and so for the question about civil society and who drives the effort for um, lobbying or for this, the displaced, I would say that, Sebastian, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's two groups, us mm -hmm. and um, El Instituto Mora. El Instituto Mora has, in Mexico City, has um, m made uh, a good contribution to the discussion and debate on, on internal displacement, but they've been quite quiet for the past year, so I don't know what's happening to them. There's a few individuals working in Sinaloa. Um, I think La Comisión Estatal de Derechos Humanos, a human rights um, organization in Sinaloa, has been very vocal uh, in, in, in providing information about the vulnerabilities of the displaced in Sinaloa. Uh, there, there have been a lot of vocal people also in, in Chihuahua, but there hasn't been a, a national effort to converge and to discuss. Um, so I don't think anybody is in the driving seat. I think there's uh, some of us just trying to talk in, in our own um, uh, environments, uh, but there's I haven't seen any systematic effort coming from one actor. Thank you. Um, thanks. So on the question about the <coughs> what could be a catalyst for the shift, I think as Steve mentioned, uh, there has already been uh, a beginning for that shift. And uh, the catalyst for that was obviously the change in administration and the fact that the new administration didn't w w wasn't so invested in the response that, that drove this, this whole thing in the first place. So there, there, there are openings already taking place. So, ba so basically the catalyst in that case has been sort of a change in political stakes, I guess. Um, also, more and more um, coverage from the media, from I mean, civil society, as Laura was mentioning. I think you didn't mention uh, the National Commission on uh, Human yeah, Rights. Sorry. Also, importantly, they have been outspoken about it and are also in the process of doing this protocol that Steve was mentioning. So, so these different actors, I mean, the Human Rights Commission, the civil society organizations, the media, um, all these things are contributing to it. So I guess it's like any social pr uh, change process. It requires you know, <laughs> different pressure from different um, parts of society, uh, from government institutions as well. So I think that's already taking place and has changed in the, the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to add something? Yeah, yeah just, just on that, that uh, people have followed the uh, terrible natural disasters as well. Certainly a, um, a great deal of sympathy for those victims and, and understanding those that have had to flee their homes because of natural disasters. Well, that's not the, the main cause of displacement that we've been following. It certainly leads people to begin to think about this phenomenon of, of, of victims of, of, of uh, specific incidents that have to flee and relocate. And some of the senators, for instance, have come to this constituency because of different reasons. And they recognize that organized crime is, a, is a, one of the principal causes, but maybe in their, uh, in their, in their state, uh, the principal cause is either religious or, or, um, or political conflicts or, or natural disasters. Um, so that, that certainly expands uh, the, the, the constituencies around, around change and recognition of, of the phenomenon of internal displacement, but it also creates some, some challenges in terms of defining the scope and, 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 and recognizing the problem of, of organized crime. Uh, induced uh, internal displacement. Thank you. We had a question over here, uh, two questions over here, and one at the back there, so one over here as well. Thanks. Everyone's uh, woken up now, that's great. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> um, I'm a former student of Laura's. <laughs> my name is Ivan Becerer, and my question for the panelists is, I think the evidence suggests that there is, there are two different types of dynamics between civil society and organized crime. I think one is exploitation, which was exemplified by Laura, and the other is social support. My question is, how does that dynamic change with displacement? So does, for example, extortion become aggravated because there are less people and under the assumption that organized crime uh, needs to meet payroll, pay sicarios or whatever? Um, does, does it happen in places where social support is prevalent and then does social support decrease? That's, that's my question. Ali, there's a question down here in the front. Vanessa, did you have the question? Yeah. I did, actually. The microphone's on its way. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. I, I was wondering if you could, if, if you had a little bit more information. You've mentioned a couple of times now people being displaced because of religious motives. I found that um, rather interesting. It would, from, from what religion were they been, um, I don't want to say persecuted, but from what religious group might they be um, moving from towards, towards, towards another lo location? Thank you. Thank you. And then directly behind you. Hi, my name is Anna. I'm a master's student in Latin American Studies at Georgetown, and I was working on the same topic for a class in human rights, and I was asked if the conflict in Mexico could be seen as a non-international armed conflict. And reading one of the Sebastián Albuja's mm, uh, papers, um, I was wondering if that is the case and we treat it as a non as a non international armed conflict what will be the implication for the humanitarian crisis and that it would mean mm -hmm. any change and also related to that um, a s group of civilians lawyers professors have advanced in before the icc um, an investigation against uh, felipe calderon and other uh, criminals and i would like to know your opinion uh, if this could be a case that is going to be investigated or there is no room for that because the, the Mexico, Me Mexican, Mexican state has the capacity to deal with that. Thank you. Okay, let's take those three. I know there's another question over here and if we can come around to you in the, in the third round, would that be okay? That's fine. Thank you. Um, so for the first question about social support, I think um, one of the consequences of the strategy against the, <coughs> the drug lords was that it has contributed to the fragmentation of the bigger organizations and uh, we have smaller linchpins that have uh, uh, embarked on all forms of uh, crimes around uh, the country. However, also, we can just notice uh, deterioration of the social and political environment everywhere in the country. And there are many small gangs committing petty, petty crimes that have taken advantage of the whole insecurity and particularly of impunity. So before, uh, there was social supports from these, the bigger cartels because they invested so much money in social projects <coughs> like schools, uh, sporting, um, sporting grounds, uh, and they helped the community. So the community would, didn't have to leave because they felt safe in the area where the cartels were operating because they received a lot of support from them. But when this uh, bigger organizations were uh, broken and the whole insecurity started to spread out and smaller uh, linchpins that had no connection to the bigger lords embarked on petty crime, that had a, a, a big impact on insecurity as a whole. And threats came from these small uh, uh, people that had no connection to the bigger to the bigger drug distribution routes or anything of that sort, but they contributed enor enormously to to the perception of threat in many communities. So I think the breaking of that social support is that what has caused displacement in many areas of the country. I don't know if th that was more or less what you were aiming for your question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think okay. The consequences of the most yes. Yes. Um, as to religious motives, um, particularly in Oaxaca, Chiapas, and Guerrero, we have uh, like Catholic majorities persecuting uh, Protestant minorities. So it's within Christian denominations that um, the persecution takes place. So. Um, and as to the non-international armed conflicts? Thanks, yeah, that's a, a really good question. I think connects to that chart that I was showing, so where, where is this falling into the international law category? Um, so yes, basically, 
um, an inter a non-international armed conflict can be characterized to exist, uh, to exist ac according to two criteria. So the first is the intensity of the violence and the organization of the groups. Um, so, but this is still kind of broad because you know you can still ask what's intense and what's not. I mean, you have gang violence in Chicago, and is that intense or not? Um, so then there's there's different uh, case law that basically looks at four um, four criteria within the intensity. So the duration of the violence, the types of weapons that are used, wh whether the military intervenes, and whether there's displacement. And so uh, that's the analysis that I, I did in that paper that maybe you saw is that those four things actually have taken place in Mexico. I mean, it's. Um, it's not sporadic. It's not that it was violence that sort of, you know, an uprise that happened, you know, for two weeks or something. It's, it's been going on for six years, for a number of years. Um, the types of weapons are high caliber because these groups have a lot of money and, you know, the, the whole weapons trade with the U.S., etc. The military obviously has been present and there has been displacement. Um, so that's certainly, you know, um, sort of check <laughs> it has taken place. And then uh, as to the organization of the groups, that's the tricky one because it's, uh, it's not clear how organized the groups are. And this is important because it connects to your second question of what, what would mean if actually IHL, so this is a non-international armed conflict and international humanitarian law applies because uh, effectively these groups have to be able to have representatives and to negotiate and to engage in peace processes, et cetera. And it's unclear with the fragmentation of the cartels that they actually have that level of, of organization. I mean, it's known that they're organized in terms of very effective in terms of how they manage the drug trade. They're you know, very entrepreneurial and organized and have chains of sort of command, but uh, they're fragmented. You can't compare them to the FARC in Colombia that are a proper military <coughs> almost. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that, ju that judgment is less clear because of the second element. But it would mean, I mean, it would mean a lot of things. I think it would contribute to the shift I was, I was, talking, to, uh, I was talking about before because if this were an inter non-international armed conflict, the whole protection response that exists everywhere else where there is such conflict would kick in and there would be more uh, pressure and more interest from international uh, protection agencies to intervene and to, to work with the government in Mexico. Um, the different IHL protections would apply more clearly, so the distinction between combatants and civilians, the, the respect of medical facilities. I mean, as you know, in Mexico, a huge issue is the attacks on, on ambulances and hospitals even mm -hmm. to take you know, preventions and other reasons. So that clearly is not respected. So all these implications would certainly be clear. And now just to say, it's not that anyone really declares a conflict to be a, a non it, it, the ICRC, which is the guardian of international law, doesn't do that. That declaration uh, is very conservative in that sense. So it's really up to, I mean, governments are obviously very, aren't inclined to say so. And so it's sort of, a, 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 a sort of a, an interpretation that happens through moral pressure, I don't know. Uh, so in the case of Mexico, there are voices saying that it could be that that the, the conditions um, apply, and it's especially that that the armed groups or the cartels should uh, should respect this distinction of you know civilians and, and combatants, etc. But um, but it's not that that declaration has been done conclusively by anyone. Great, <coughs> thank you, Steve. Do you want to add something? J just just on that, on that uh, building on what Sebastian said in terms of some of the the the, the current analysis has been that organized crime has tried to co-opt state at local level and at different levels within Mexico in order to protect its business, in order to give it, you know, advantages in, in the drug trade. And that's been, but as we've seen, there's been a shift or expansion of those activities to a, all a, an array of, of extortion and, 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 and other economic activities that will provide them with any sorts of, 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 of economic uh, uh, revenue. And that, I think, changes a bit, that, 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 that challenges a bit that, that, that notion. And, and the second thing is that uh, what's going on in Michoacan right now with, with self-defense groups and particularly the, 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 the Knights Templarios, Caballeros Templarios, it, I think it also, uh, I'm, I'm, I know there's a the big reticence in Mexico to, to uh, have comparisons with Colombia, and, uh, and I said I wasn't going to mention Colombia at all, but I think <laughs> Michoacan, uh, uh, working from Colombia and work, having worked on Colombia for many years, Michoacan and the dynamics of Michoacan uh, reflect the reality of territorial dispute, of co-opting the state for all whole assortment of activities, both cultivation, uh, timber, um, all sorts of local business interests, uh, money laundering. These are, these are very similar dynamics of what's happening in the Pacific coast of, of, of Colombia. Um, that's not to say that that automatically means that this is the same conflict. There's, there's a big dispute at, actually in Colombia about whether those, those circumstances of conflict actually uh, should be considered armed conflict or simply organized crime. So it's, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that that, uh, that is for sure. But I think what's happening, I think it deserves greater attention to look at what's happening in Michoacan and currently, and particularly the initiatives of wanting to build a social movement around the, the caballeros and, and fight against uh, self-defense groups. And uh, that, that territorial dispute certainly is not only about drug trafficking alone, so. Thank you. Question back here, and then another one here. I'm 
met June Vital with the Congressional Research Service. And um, I just want to get a sense of scope again, and I'm not going to push on a number, <laughs> but would you consider this a worsening crisis? And, um, and I'm reflecting on there is some information that numbers of homicides are decreasing in Mexico. So would you say that this is increasing at some particular rate, or how much information do we have about that? And, and do you have any information about people that may have returned, like to Juarez, after displacing? Interesting. Yeah, one here, please, <coughs> Charlie. Uh, Shireen Stark with Brookings Project on Internal Displacement. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight from the testimonials as to the um, profile of the IDPs that you were able to speak with, because obviously there's not enough by way of um, official surveys and data, um, and also is there any kind of sense of um, sexual and gender-based violence having been committed um, uh, against people who um, become IDPs? And also, um, I had a question about resorting to the IACHR. Um, is that something the, the International, Amer the, sorry, the Inter-American Court uh, for Human Rights, um, is that something that is, I mean, you've spoken of the limitations of civil society organization, um, not really like a whole national momentum necessarily, um, but is there any movement on in, in that in pursuing that avenue? Um, thanks. Great, thank you. Do we have any more questions at this time? Okay, what do you, uh, who wants to take the lead on this round? Worsening crisis, I think you guys are better. Ah. Yeah. Um, about the worsening of the crisis, I think um, <coughs> although we have, uh, yeah, there's a few statistics that say that uh, homicide rates are diminishing, and which might be true in some cases, I think the crimes that lead to displacement are not diminishing. So extortion and threats are at the peak, I would say. Um, mm. And also before we had no rates of uh, extortion, I don't think uh, INEHI produced any statistics on, on, on crimes like that in a systematic way as they have been through uh, pressure and, and that. So it's not only homicides that we use that as a variable to gauge the extent of the crisis, but it's not the only variable that we've been looking at. And for us, extortion and threat and the general sense of insecurity are um, important triggers of, uh, of displacement. Um, about people returning, there are a lot of instances in um, Tamaulipas, for example, where people have fled uh, temporarily and then the government, the local government has helped them return. But you never get uh, the same sense of uh, community again because some people are afraid to go back once they've been threatened um, massively. Or, um, so, so a lot of communities are broken because of that. And uh, as far as, um, and did I get the, the question right about um, if there is a use of uh, uh, regional instruments? Um, well, just on Friday, tomorrow. I think, tomorrow, tomorrow um, there is a hearing on displacement, disappearances, and um, human, human trafficking. trafficking. So I think that could tell you a bit of what's going on. Um. So just to add to that, so we have that hearing tomorrow. Um, that's simply a hearing, sort of informational. Um, then the other avenue is whether people are going to bring contentious yeah. cases to the commission and the court. And I don't know if, I mean, we're, we haven't done it. I don't know if that's being contemplated. But it would certainly be effective in terms of uh, contributing mm -hmm. to, that, to that shift. Um, in terms of the profile that, Jarin, you were asking, the profile of the people displaced. So I think Lara described a bit. So. Um, I mean, people that, that have money are able to go earlier because they, they're less comfortable with the climate of security and if they receive threats, they have the means to move. But also we've seen small business owners, and this, mm. this has been documented by the Chamber of Commerce in Ciudad Juarez, for example. So very like, almost corner stores that are asked for these vacunas, for these payments, you know, for security, then um, they close because they can't afford it, they don't want to pay, they flee. Um, 
also people that were migrants in the first place and maybe had lesser roots in the place of the, the, where they were living were more prone to, to go. Whereas, uh, so for example, a lot of migrants from the south and the north who came to work in maquilas, in factories, they, they left when the violence, when the situation of, of security declined, so they went back because they weren't really from there, even though they came maybe 10, 20 years ago. Um, also, young males, um, usually because they've been sort of even, uh, you know, forcibly recruited or paid to be part of the groups, usually what families do is they, they ship them somewhere else to some relatives in a different state uh, in that group. In terms of gender-based violence, um, no, I don't have no, any, no. any evidence. No, uh, no, no, not from testimonials. Um, yeah. and, and one thing I might add is um, <coughs> there was a case that was uh, quite high-sounding and was the case of the Juarochos, which are um, people originally from Veracruz who migrated to uh, the Valley of Juarez during the Maquiladora peak years and um, in 2010 they um, were harassed and they were becoming uh, victims of all sorts of crimes and they asked the uh, government of Veracruz to be um, assisted to be repatriated <laughs> repatriated to uh, Veracruz so these people who had made a, a, a living in in Juarez and Reynosa and other border towns um, uh, went back to Veracruz, and in Veracruz they were offered all sorts of assistance, which at the very end never really uh, was never really delivered. So these people were victimized a second time, and um, so they haven't been able to make a living in Veracruz. So some decided to go back to Juarez in uh, when where they had lost their homes and everything else. So they to start uh, a new once crime rates in Juarez had um, diminished. But many others uh, decided to stay within Veracruz and, uh, and live in horrible conditions, fascinated with families and um, with no protection whatsoever. Uh, so they've been three years without any form of assistance. Um, so there are instances of people going back and becoming, it's like a double kind of victimization uh, and there's no protection or assistance coming through. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your, uh, for your attendance here. I'd like to give a big round of applause to our panelists. Please continue to, uh, to check our website for upcoming events um, and uh, I urge you all to, uh, to follow very closely what's happening in Mexico at this time. Thank you so much. Thank you.